the goal today is to essentially um, have a bit of you know uh, a bit of sarcastic approach, and that's the uh, that's the aim at the uh, with this um, at uh, complexity. Uh, so uh, thanks, Vincent, from the for the uh, amazing intro. Um, but um, my my aim is really to focus towards um, uh, how not to reach the complexity, uh, and we're gonna see in a minute why. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Stan. I'm 34, come from France, I've been here for 10 years now, uh, really loving the country by the way. Um, I like to boulder, I like to woodwork, and I very much like bad jokes. Um, one might say dad jokes, but I don't have children, so you know, I do, I do like this. And on the uh, right side of the screen, um, a, a very good uh, LinkedIn extract. Um, the idea is not to go over this uh, with you guys, but the idea is to preface the talk with this because that's going to serve as, um, how can I say that, um, a reference point and everything needs to be filtered through this because what I'm going to be talking about is essentially my own experience and that's going to be a lot of uh, written on experience. So obviously if you don't have my experience, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a bit hard to, uh, to, to, um, to conclude anything. Um, for who, whom, I never know which uh, is the correct English manner, um, so I put both. Um, so for uh, smaller teams than five, uh, which I, I used to, to work at as well, uh, where essentially the CTO is, the lead dev is, the CPO, the product manager, the UX designer, the CEO, whatever, um, the idea is just to give, give you guys a bit of ideas to on how to deliver a quality product, right? It's just to get started. As as we expect with uh, teams of this size, when we go on to, uh, into the uh, medium teams territory, um, you're starting to have more uh, more pe more people, more resources. So the CTO is not necessarily the same person as the lead, not this is necessarily the same person as the product manager, and you start to have this kind of uh, departments, right? Big words, fancy fancy words. Uh, when you when you reach that scale. And here is going to be a bit more interesting because that's going to be the focus uh, on how to essentially uh, communicate with everyone. And here, goal is to have give you a bit of ideas on how to build a delivery pipeline and to sustain one, right? For bigger teams, you have people from Odoo there. Uh, they know what they do much better than, uh, than, than I could imagine. Uh, never worked in those, and so my only hope is that it gives you some ideas to slice better, maybe uh, some areas of expertise. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's uh, not yet big, uh, big caveat. Uh, so please uh, filter out and take everything I say with a grain of salt, right? That's our starting hypothesis for today. Um, so usually this is a circle, right? Um, let's uh, let's not talk about waterfall and agile and all of these kind of religions uh, today. Um, but usually the goal is to have a circle. I'm super bad at design. I'm colorblind, so colors fucked up. Um, but anyway, um, I put it an, in a straight line because I'm going to go uh, uh, go at it uh, synchronously. And the idea is to have the smallest uh, the, the 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 smallest uh, sorry. Um, size, the closest feedback loop, as I put it, between the ID and the user, the customer, right? Don't really mind engineering product. It's just usually those are the areas of expertise. As I've said, smaller teams, it's collapsed. Bigger teams, you might have a lot of different uh, aspects in between. Um, and the focus for today are going to be on those segments. We have four of them, five because I couldn't help myself uh, in the uh, next slide, but, um, but yeah four segments, that's going to be the topic, and we're going to see how we can shrink them and make them more efficient one by one. Once again, only a return on experience. There are plenty of other uh, ways to do that. Um, most of them could be blog posts, uh, books, even just complete, uh, complete conferences. That's the basis, that's a very uh, personal and opinionated uh, one, but I believe it's, uh, it stands uh, at the very minimum for any, each and every team. Um, you need to have confidence in the way you ship. That's the ship, ship, not the animal, uh, in the way you ship, uh, you send something to production. Um, the first one being CI/CD's pipeline. I don't really care if you do trunk-based development, if you do uh, feature-based branch or whatever. 
you do you, but the idea is to have a system on which you can rely on, right? If you have a good system, and you don't have to have the fanciest one, especially at first, and I sure uh, did not have the best one uh, when I got started, um, but you need to have one because it's gonna help us communicate it through the rest of the team or the teams. Um, and then we get to the second point is everybody should ship, right? Um, because when everybody ships with confidence, it means that you have something that works for everyone, um, especially from intern to senior. I've had uh, uh, recently, uh, yeah, a couple of months ago, uh, a new intern and she was essentially saying, yeah, I'm not super confident in the way, you know, uh, put th putting things into production. And so the issue was not her, it was me because essentially that's the system I designed was not uh, welcoming enough, right? So we reworked that and from now on, uh, we have something that works just a little bit better. And we need to have trust at all levels, levels of seniority, but especially levels of you know infrastructure. Um, my CEO needs to trust that the team is going to ship accordingly uh, and all the stakeholders in the company, right? Just a little caveat. So the actual first point, we're actually going to get started now and it's been six minutes, perfect. Um, we're going to talk about the segment between code and user, right? Um, once again, we could be a book, could be tons of books. I'm just going to focus on testing. Um, very glad uh, to, hear to hear that Odoo is super advanced here. I might have a look at Runbot. Um, and the first advice I would give is to really think about the testing architecture that, you can that you're going to put in place. Um, we, can, we could talk about this for ages. Um, I just put like unit versus integration. Um, I like to oppose them. They should not be opposed, to be honest. Uh, but for the sake of the argument, I'm going to oppose them a bit. And I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. And the second point for the how to test uh, methodology is essentially thinking about enforcing separation of concern, something I heard in the previous talks as well. Um, you should think twice about adding complexity to a class. And from my experience, it's easier to avoid doing that if you have a test, because the test most of the time is going to be a bit closer, a tad closer to the uh, business case, uh, and a bit easier to understand than just the raw class. And so the moment you start adding, you know, adding stuff to uh, the class and adding something a bit more complex, most of the time, at least from my experience, once again, the test is the uh, garde-fou, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, is the thing that triggers uh, something in my head and say, whoa, should it be another class? Should it be here? Should it, should it not be? Um, so that's, uh, that's the thing. Um, I put this wonderful thing here, uh, Stan's experience. Um, I have three or four across the, uh, the talk. Um, and so that's just to give me a bit more space to uh, talk about an anecdote. Um, Testing the boundaries, why I do love uh, unit testing. It's personally, it's because um, it forces me to think uh, about my system as subsystems. And it's a really healthy uh, way, I believe, to look at a global system, right? Each modular service has a contract, that's the way I see it. And the unit test is essentially ensuring that all the contracts, they are met at any given point in time, right? So that's what I do, I test the contract why I said that unit tests should not be opposed to integration tests is because, well, if you have contract A and contract B, how do you make sure that contract A can talk to contract B? Well, yeah, so you have to have some meta test and usually, at least at my scale, it's done through an integration test where we essentially align all the modules one after another and we make sure that we can go through them all in one go. But the actual meat, the actual uh, um, concerns regarding the test is really at the unit level. The second question is essentially a um, discussion I had when I joined my current company, Recover. Um, and the idea is they were uh, essentially testing a connection to a third party API. And so I arrived and say, yeah, but the conversation is super interesting actually, um, because if you test the third party API is you think you're responsible for their downtime, for their behavior, right? And my point is you're not. What you're responsible of is um, if they are done, then you react accordingly. And that's a very different aspect as being responsible for um, third party API. We're not um, 
uh, plugged directly to, to Odoo, so we don't have to care about Odoo downtime. Uh, but if we had, um, well, I want to I wanna care about if no Odoo is downtime, I want to care about if my system is going to go down with it, right? Not, I should not be able to deploy because a third party is down, right? So that's personal, uh, personal experience. Obviously, for unit test, there are limits. Um, two doors on the left. I, I, I found this video. I thought it was uh, more recent. Uh, it's from 20, uh, 2007. I found it on the very old Twitter post. Um, and the thing is here, I don't have a wire. I can walk. Yes. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the door over there, well, it's going to block the second one. Yeah. Unit tests are good. Doors o door opens, door opens, but two together, they don't open. Integration test. Voila. Um, second point. Now we're to uh, from the feature and the code. So the idea is still testing. Engineering side is going to be all focused on testing today. Um, and still testing. What do we test? Do we test the color of the button? Do we test uh, the critical path, for example? Um, the answer is yeah. M for us, uh, we get started with this. Obviously, if we have more resources, go crazy. Uh, we don't, so we can't. Um, and so we, we have to be very, very um, specific in what we test. And, and so that's, that's my go-to, uh, my mental mind map onto uh, what I do. So we're going to start with critical path. So as a bit of a backstory, uh, Recover, the company I work for, is essentially a fintech, and we manage uh, payment recovery and this kind of stuff for um, uh, uh, small and uh, SMEs, small and medium businesses. Um, recovery plan assignation, so essentially saying this invoice has been uh, unpaid for 30 days, so it needs to go into this recovery plan. Super critical for us. Like that's the very basis of what we do. If we if we mess this up, then we might as well stop doing business, right? So obviously this needs to be thoroughly tested. The profile picture upload, not my business. It's good. It's good. Uh, the designer is going to be very happy. Uh, it's going to look better on the pages and everything. But to be honest, I I don't care as much as the rec recovery plan assignation. Obviously, because once again, not my business. If you're uh, what was the name of that Gravatar back in the days, uh, if you're Gravatar, um, which is essentially a profile picture service, you should care. But I don't. What to test? Second point, complex logic. Um, to <laughs> and that's why I, I told Vincent it's, uh, it's closer and closer to his talk. Um, because uh, when he argues that, yeah, uh, you might not need to, to do this, well, I'm saying if you really have to, um, well, make sure it's, it's authority tested. Here, another example of bus uh, recover business, matching a payment and an invoice to mark an invoice as paid. Super interesting, super complex, even though it might not look like it. Uh, so obviously, we're going to make sure that this is thoroughly tested. Uh, as for the random ifs that we have everywhere in the code, less less important. And finally, on code coverage, um, once again, um, sometimes a healthy debate. Um, I could not care less about code coverage, at least the number, right? Um, saying, yeah, I'm 90% uh, uh, covered or 89. Sure. The thing is, it's too easy to manipulate it to be taking it uh, without context, like, much, uh, like uh, most things, I would say. Um, but yeah, still, um, the good thing that we found was reports on untested branches. So essentially, you have a case statement, um, and through the code coverage tool that you have, you figure out, OK, the, uh, the statement number three for whatever uh, condition is not tested. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Then we can discuss, right? Um, but we're, we stopped being uh, adamant on code coverage. The only thing we try to maintain, but that's not uh, a golden rule, is it should go up. But that's about it, right? Because once again, too easy manipulated. As a bonus, if you're Boeing, maybe test a bit more, but that's just uh, common sense. Um, and I mean, I prefaced everything by saying I was a bit sarcastic, so you're, you're, uh, you'll help me out with this one if the lawyers come knocking. Um, but um, so yeah, what I wanted to say with that is uh, use Boeing as a, as a good excuse to um, 
put a bit of a grain of salt as well on what I'm saying. Uh, I'm working in, in a fintech, I'm working with financial da data, uh, super important to get it right, get it uh, secure, uh, get it private and, and so on. Um, so not saying that I do, uh, I, I play the cowboy at the office. That being said, I'm not uh, helping out uh, children, uh, I'm not uh, in the business of running a hospital. If I go down, like we did this morning, thanks Scalingo for the global outage, um, if we go out, nobody dies. Right, that's a shame, and obviously we try to uh, always figure out uh, n how to not go down. Um, but once again, we're not Boeing. If something goes down, an <laughs> an aircraft is not going down. Let's move toward the product side of things now. Still on the feature code side, right? I'm still uh, on the uh, same aspect, um, and here essentially. So this is my good friend uh, Wilfredo Pareto. Um, super fan of Pareto. Everything that uh, concerns the Pareto principle, uh, take with a grain of salt as well. Um, because essentially it has no backing in, it's, it's merely empirical at best. Um, so the 80% 80, 80 versus 20%, take that with a grain of salt. That being said, I'm a huge fan of uh, the mental trigger to apply it as much as I can. Um, it just to serve as you know uh, um, a mental reference point. So here, as a product, when you slice a feature and you give it to the engineering team so they can code it, most of the time the exercise I play with my product teams before uh, when I was uh, on my previous company, a bigger one, where I had a product manager and someone to play ping pong with at that point, or here, and I play it internally in my head because I have the two uh, caskets, the two uh, caps, um, is what do the first 20% look like? Essentially trying to cut down the fat, trim, uh, whatever analogy, uh, food analogy you want to have. Um, but essentially, yeah, we need to have the, the uh, yeah, the, the less is better, essentially. Um, the vital few and the useful many, yes. Um, and so the application of Pareto principle here would be 80% of the feature for 20% of the effort, right? And I have a good example of that uh, later in the, uh, in the return on experience. What it translates into is maybe you don't need a fully fledged feature. Maybe you just need an MPP, uh, proof of concept. Maybe what you need is something semi-static, right? Um, and <coughs> the timing was absolutely perfect thanks Thierry uh, because this is this has been screenshotted this morning actually uh, so that was yesterday or two days ago and Thierry put it in in, in, uh, in a very good word and here the uh, this is the part that matters to me he says uh, well we don't need to be generic when essentially uh, we don't know if we're gonna have to be generic and even if, if we know we have to it might be the wrong genericity genericity new word um, and essentially the the goal of that is to try to battle this um, yeah, yeah th this idea that we know where we're going um, when essentially when we are in a startup we always have these great ideas and uh, and how many times I heard in the last 10 years um, someone say yeah if we do this we're golden well my previous company I confounded it eight years uh, after we started it, it crashed. And the if we have this were golden ideas, we had a couple. Um, so just to give you a bit of insight as to, well, most of the time, golden idea, m bad idea. Um, and maybe we, uh, we should have listened to uh, Thierry and say, well, you know, maybe we build something specific at first instead of trying to build everything at once. Still on the same feature code segment, something that, a, and it, it might be obvious, and to be honest, if I, wa if I were to be presented with that, even a couple of years ago, I would have said, duh, of course. So, yes, uh, past Stan, sorry, but engineers should be part of the solution and they should be at the table, at the product table. Because we need to un understand and we need to, uh, architecture essentially is gonna start over there. If we design a moonshot, um, so if we design something with uh, uh, AI, for example, and we say, yeah, that's my CEO, it's coming to me and say, yeah, we need AI because 
It looks good in a pitch, sure, no problem, but we're going to put it over there, right? We're not going to put it in the core system because we don't know if it's going to work and it's a moonshot. If we're designing a paid for feature, maybe it's going to be super specific, maybe it's going to be super generic, and we're going to see an example right after. And when it's foundational to the business and we're going to have an example, then, you know, then we can, uh, we can spend a bit more time and effort on it. And it's a good throwback to testing strategies as well. Not going to apply the same strategies for these three different kind of um, features. And so, I don't know why the last one is not there. Um, and so just a li little back of uh, return on experience, the moonshot or whatever uh, buzzword we, we want to have, um, well, happened in the past on my, uh, in my uh, profe professional life. Yeah, we do this, it's there. Sometimes it pans out, some s sometimes it don't, it doesn't. Well, it's okay, it's isolated. Paid for, we had, some, uh, for example, someone, so once again, super small startup, so it might uh, look weird to, to you that we don't have an SAML slash SSO uh, kind of mechanism. We don't, we're about to, because someone paid for it. Um, and it's super generic. It's gonna help uh, all of the clients, so it's gonna get a special treatment, right? But when a client says, yeah, I want an export in a whatever format. Um, we offer a CSV and this client, specific client wants an XLSX. We don't believe it's going to impact the rest of the customer base. So once again, put it over there and try to isolate it a bit. As for foundations, Ro uh, Recover started uh, uh, very focused on the automations. Now we're um, looking more and more towards the business intelligence capabilities that we have because we have a lot of data. So that's, that's foundational for the strategy of the, uh, of the company. So obviously it's going to get a special treatment. And the last part for product is essentially now that the uh, engineers are at the uh, product table and they get a better understanding of where we're going with the different features we're talking about, we finally can tackle the uh, complex versus trivial, trivial implementations. We can not only feed from the product to better design the architecture, but we can go the other way around as well. We can have easier features and, and less expensive features because the engineers are here with us, right? And so we can start uh, targeting low hanging fruits and stop doing the exp expensive fad, even if we, you know, sometimes we'd like to. The second point is increased ownership across all the teams. That's especially true when you're starting to divide, uh, you know, the startup is starting to grow and you hire a uh, product, you hire a UX designer, and so now it's a product department. They do their thing on their end and the engineering team is too big to be in the same room every time with, with, uh, with everyone. And so it starts to get uh, um, a bit of a shame, but sometimes it starts to get, uh, you, you start to get some distance. It can work, but most of the time, just having you know an emissary, someone that's going to be in the room and that's going to act as you know the representative, is a very good idea. Cut down eighty percent of the work that account for twenty percent of the value. Wilfredo, my man. Product and engine collab. That's uh, that's the uh, second uh, on my end. Um, let's avoid the. Can you do it? Yes. Perfect. For when? Two years, a million dollars. Can I do it? Yeah, of course. Um, so that's the thing. If we can start earlier the conversation, then we can see that you know we can we can get something uh, in an easier fashion. And at Dropbox, the company I was talking to you uh, before, uh, after eight years, no, that's that's a lie. After se seven years, we still could not remove actually remove a user, and so we had strategies around and everything. And, and it's a bit shameful to, to, to say that because I was in charge of the department, <laughs> but uh, we really had to have this conversation over and over to actually internalize the fact that, guys, we can't remove a user. The fuck are we doing at the robotics at that point? But you know, user, they have leads and they have, I mean, a, a whole myriad and constellation of resources they're linked to, right? And so we said, yeah, but how do you do this, that? Well, easy part is we're not, not going to remove user. We're actually, actually just going to disable them. 
And the thing is, that's where the shame comes from. Should have thought of that earlier, but it took us to be in the same room with projects, with some engineers to actually say, yeah, that's these are the issues. Let's work this as a team. So to go back to the um, to the title, uh, testing in prod does not mean breaking the prod. Please don't break the prod. Um, but the thing is, testing ma can me mean a lot of things. And I kind of twisted the term to talk about what I'm passionate about. Tests as uh, automatic test, unit test, and running experiment on the product side. If we run experiment and we monitor the results, then we get a better idea of how the business is going and what works, what doesn't. And the less, um, the, the more we monitor, the less we're going to do, the less we're going to do, the simpler uh, our life and our app is going to be in the coming years. And that's about it, right? Rinse and repeat. Thank you, everybody.